A 3D platformer is a real challenge to build, so much so that it's almost a prerequisite to building more complex games. Today we're going to lay the foundation of our new project by creating a player controller and its dependencies. It'll set the stage for us to continue diving into programming patterns and game architecture. If you watch for a bit and you like what you see, consider hitting the like button and subscribing to the channel. It helps me make more content like this. Lots to do today, so let's get into it. I've started a new URP project in Unity 2022 LTS. If I go over to project settings here in the editor, I'll set my namespace to be platformer. Over in the player, if you want, you can set your company name and a project name if you haven't already. Today, I want to quickly write the first part of what will soon become our one-click project setup tool. And that's a script that will create all our folders for us. Because this script will eventually be part of a separate package, let's make a new folder for it, which I'll just call My Tools. You might want to give it a more personal name since it will eventually contain your own library of code that you like to have in all your projects. Let's call this first script Setup, and we'll be developing this particular script over the next few videos so that it will install all your favorite packages and assets in one click. So the first thing we need in here is a publicly accessible method and we'll make it a static method, just create default folders. And in here, we're going to call a class that we're going to write that'll handle everything related to folders for our tool. So inside of here, let's just make one static method, create default. It's going to take a root folder and a array of subfolders to use. And we want the full path. We're going to call the path class method combine and use uh, Unity's application data path combined with our root folder name. Then we'll iterate over all the folders. And again, we'll get that path name to where we want the folder to be. And then we'll use the directory classes method create directory from that path. And then back in our create default folders, let's just list what we want the root to be and then all of the subfolder names. And then we're going to use the Unity editor asset database refresh method that will refresh everything in the editor for us. And let's just take all of these top level classes and let's make them static imports. And really that's, that's it. I'm just going to add a menu item for this as well. And we can jump back in the editor and try it out. So now if we come back into the editor and recompile our scripts and jump up to the tools menu, you'll see a new section here called setup. And inside we have create default folders. And if we click this, it'll create all of our project folders for us. And we'll never waste another second doing that manually again. We're going to keep working on that tool over the next few videos to get it importing packages and assets. Hit that like button if you found that useful, or subscribe to the channel if you want to see that tool develop. Okay, let's get on with our game. For now, we just need two packages and one open source project to get going, so let's jump over to a package manager. All we really need for this video is the Cinemachine and the new input system. And we're going to import Kyle Banks's scene reference attribute as well, which you can do just by importing it from the Git URL. Uh, link to that in the description. I'm also just going to drag in the default scenes folder into our project folder because um, this will be a little more accessible there. So the only other thing I want to pull in before we start writing code is this free asset RPG Tiny Hero Duo made by Dungeon Mason, which I really like. It's got a bunch of humanoid animations and whatnot. So I've already got it downloaded. Just click import and bring it down and you'll have it here in this folder. So let's have a look at the materials quickly because this is not made for URP. So they're all pink except for the skybox. Let's go up to edit, rendering, materials, convert selected, and you just click OK. That'll fix all of them. So let's grab one of the prefabs here and drag it into the scene and have a look at it. Just make sure it looks correct. F to zoom in. Yeah, well, it looks fine. While we're over here, why don't we create a few other objects in our scene? Let's make a just a real super basic ground plane. I'm just going to move it down a little bit. Just so I don't have to adjust the player at all. And let's zoom out here. Why don't we... Let's make a few obstacles because... It's hard to tell with just a flat plane if the character is moving around correctly or not. So I'm just going to make a few cubes here and spin them around at funny angles so that they look uh, noticeable when we're moving around. You can put materials on them if you want. All right, that's looking pretty good. The first thing we're going to start with here is handling input. So let's jump up to our scripts folder, make a new subfolder, we'll just call it input. 
and we're going to start a new C sharp class called input reader. Now we also need to define an input actions asset to work with the new input system. Now, if I right click here, it's the last thing in the context menu and it's right off my screen. So you can get that from the top level menu under assets as well. Just create input actions. Now, if you do this, you're going to get the default, which has no actions. Let's just have a look at it. And you'd have to manually go and add every single button and keyboard input that you wanted. So let's get rid of that. I'm just going to delete it. The another slightly easier way is you can add the player input component to any game object and then click create actions here. That'll give you the default. Let's make one of these and I'll just call it platformer here, which is the default. And let's have a look at it. Now we've used this in other projects before because it has almost everything that a basic vertical slice would need. So your move, your look, your fire, right? Now, once you're in here, you can copy and paste any of the actions, just rename them, change some of the buttons. You can also have two projects open and copy from one project into the other, which is handy. However, the best thing to do, in my opinion, is to keep a fairly robust general input actions that you can simply drag into your project, and then you can add and remove actions as you like. Uh, so my suggestion is to go to the repository in the description of this video and just grab this one. Now you can see I've added a few more things to the default. One is mouse camera control. That is a right mouse button click. And during this video, we're only going to use that and the move action and the look action. The other actions in here we'll be using in future videos in this series. Now make sure you click save if you don't have auto save enabled and you've made any changes here. And what we're going to want to do next is generate the C Sharp class for this. So if you click the checkbox and click apply, it'll generate a C Sharp class for us. And let's pop that open and have a look because way at the bottom of this file, past all this data, there are several interfaces that we can implement in our input reader class. So let's get all the way down there, past all these callbacks, which we'll also use. But what I really care about is right here, we have the iPlayer Actions and the iUI Actions interfaces. We're going to implement those in our input reader, and all those methods have to be implemented as part of it, although we're only going to implement the player actions right now. So let's jump over to the input reader class that we created earlier and start writing some code for that. So instead of using a mono behavior, I'm going to change this to scriptable object because I want to reference this class from several places. And let's also implement the interface we were just looking at for the player actions. So if I hit control period here, it'll give me a context menu that says implement missing members. And I do want to implement all of the members of that interface. I also want to get rid of these exceptions that come in by default. Let's just put a comment that says no op. And let's move that player input actions up to be a static. So now we need to define events that are going to get fired when different things happen. So we're going to use Unity Action for that, and we're going to be passing, in some cases, some values with it. So for the Move Action, I want to pass back the Vector2 of whatever the player has been pressing to move. Same thing for Look, but I want to add a Boolean as well to define whether or not the player is using a mouse. I'd like to fire an event anytime the player presses or releases the right mouse button for when they're using the camera to look around. Um, let's get a variable here to hold our input actions. Let's make a public property called direction that will always feed out our player's movement direction. Now, in on enable, if we haven't instantiated our player input actions, let's do that and set the callbacks. And we also want to make sure that they're enabled. Now in our on move method, let's invoke our move unity action and pass in our movement vector. We're going to do the exact same thing for the look, but let's also pass in whether or not the user is using a mouse or not. To do that, let's just write a little method here is device mouse and pass in the context. And for that, Looks like Copilot already knows what I want. So let's get that and just turn it into an expression body method. So that's just seeing if the device name equals mouse. And then let's come down to on mouse control camera. And I'm just going to use a switch statement here. So when the input action phase is started, we are going to invoke the, the enabled Unity action. Otherwise, it's uh, if it's canceled, we'll call the other one the disabled mouse control. Let's tidy this up a little bit. And uh, while we're in here, we might as well define the other two classes that we're going to need to make all this work, which is a player controller 
and a camera manager. And we can just move those into their own classes now because we're going to start working on both of them right away. Having input is great, but you got to do something with it. Just before we write any more code, though, let's jump back into the editor and recompile our scripts. And let's come over here and make a few uh, in-editor adjustments. So first of all, we don't need this player input anymore. So I'm just going to remove that. And then let's uh, might as well put our camera in now. So come down to Cinemachine in your context menu and add a free look camera. You can see that it's added the brain to the main camera there with the red icon. Now, if you have the free look camera and you hit Control shift g that will create an empty parent and nest the camera under there and i'm just going to call it camera system and pull everything camera related under there and just move it up to the top so we got our main camera in there free look camera and the light now before i can make an input reader i need to add a create asset menu attribute to that uh, scriptable object class so then over here in scriptable objects we can just right click create platformer input reader now we'll be able to preference that from any scripts that need it I'm going to rename our player prefab to actually be player and let's just add our player controller to it now and then we can start writing some code for that. I'm going to change this mono behavior to be a validated mono behavior and if you're new to this channel and never seen that before that's the open source library that we imported at the start from github and it basically allows us to validate and serialize all of our references in the onValidate method and that way we don't have to do a bunch of get component calls in awake or start which can have a fairly adverse effect on your scene load times so when we use the attribute self that means that this component lives on the same game object as this particular script so we'll grab our character controller we're also going to grab our animator then we're going to need a reference to our camera and I'm going to use the attribute anywhere, which means we still have to drag and drop it in the inspector, but it will be serialized. And of course, we also need a reference to our input reader. Now let's define a few settings as well. I think the important ones that we need are move speed. We should probably define a rotation speed here that we can adjust. And finally, let's add a smooth time. This will be how fast the animator is going to change its speed. And we don't really need to worry about it too much for the character controller itself. It handles its own velocity. I want to cache a reference to our main camera in Awake as well because we're going to use it for some calculations. And in awake let's set all the properties that we want for our free look camera so we don't really have to worry about it in the inspector so that's the follow target the look at target let's also set a value for on target object warped so if the player suddenly gets moved around for some reason during our gameplay the free look camera will jump right to it this method takes in the target which we can just pass in the transform of this object and it takes in a position delta, which is just the amount the target's position has changed. It's actually kind of a difficult method to try to explain. So maybe now is a good time for me to show you guys a new feature of Rider's early access program, which is the built-in AI assistant. So if I highlight some code here and say, explain code, and it's going to start spouting off whatever it thinks uh, is relevant for the whatever I've got highlighted and passed in there. So generally I find this is useful. Um, it does make mistakes, especially during refactoring. This is not going to replace programmers. Uh, it can't build a full game for you. It certainly doesn't understand systems or more than what you've told it. Um, but it knows what's going on with this method. So I'm just going to ask it to write a one line comment, which it does. And then I can just copy and replace that in there. Now, as I understand, you don't need a writer license to try this out. I'll leave a link in the description. Uh, you see, if I highlight any code in here, it lets you start a new chat with that or suggest refactorings or find bugs. Okay, now we can start thinking about our update method, which is going to be probably the trickiest part of this code. Let's split it up into two sections here. We're going to handle movement and we're going to update our animator, which we haven't even touched yet. So let's just comment that out. So handle movement. What do we have to do to get 3D movement in a platform we're working? Well, first of all, let's make a vector out of our input. And then let's make use of the quaternion angle axis method. We'll take 
the Y rotation of our main camera compared to vector up. We want that angle multiplied by our movement direction. Now, as long as the magnitude of this vector is greater than zero, let's just make a constant for zero because it's maybe a little bit tidier than just having magic numbers floating around. Let's use quaternion look rotation to calculate the angle we want to actually look at. And then there's two ways we could potentially handle actually rotating. One is what quaternion rotate towards. That'll smoothly move us at the rotation speed towards where we want to go. There's also transform look at, which will instantly change our rotation. So I'm going to try both of them out in the editor and then decide which one will get rid of one of these lines. Finally, we got to actually calculate the adjusted movement, which is simply the direction we're going in multiplied by our speed and dot time dot delta time. And then let's actually pass that into the controller. So with all that math done, let's also store our current speed so we can use it in the animator later. So we'll need a couple of variables. I'm going to rename this one to be velocity, our reference. And let's just jump up to the top here and declare two new floats for that. So we've got our current speed and we need one for the velocity. And then that's all we really need to do to handle movement other than what if we are actually sitting at a zero magnitude. So then we're going to want that current speed to damp itself back down to zero. Let's do a little bit of refactoring here. And so we have some repeated code. Let's move all this damping into its own method here. Um, let's change it to just accept a float value. Let's extract this section into its own method. Let's call it handle rotation. We can do the same refactoring for handling what's going on with the character controller. Now we don't necessarily need to be passing these return values back. It's not, not necessary. We can make this even cleaner. We'll just pass adjusted direction around. We won't return any values. And in the smooth speed method, we'll just set the current speed there. Okay, we're almost done. Let's drag in these references now into our player controller after recompiling scripts. And I need to add a character controller to this game object. We need on validate to run again, so I'm just going to tweak one of these values. Okay, let's jump into play mode and just check the settings. So the camera is way too close to the player right now. We'll fix that. And looks like we're floating off the ground a little bit. So let's come out of play mode again and jump over to the free look camera. Down in our different radius settings here, I'm just going to change it to be 3, 10, and 6. And yeah, the camera looks good, but we're still floating. I kind of like that distance. Okay, so let's go over to our character controller and let's make some adjustments. So first of all, let's move it out of the ground, uh, but it doesn't need to be so big. Let's tweak it here, find a value that's going to work. I think what I'm going to do is set the height to 1.6 and the Y value to 0.7. Okay, still floating a little bit, but we can just tweak that as we go along here. It probably just needs to be moved a small amount. I'm also going to invert the Y and X axis on the camera because it feels kind of weird to me. And I'm just going to review some of these other settings. Now you see I've got simple follow with world up. That's probably the most basic free look camera you can have. But let's also add a little bit of noise so it feels like, a, like the camera's moving just a little bit. And we can use the simplest one, which is handheld uh, normal mild with super low values. Uh, you probably won't even notice it. And then, not strictly necessary right now, but and it's off the screen, of course, but if you click Add Extension, we can add a Cinemachine Collider here. Uh, right now, it's set to default, which is everything, and as the game develops, we're going to want to fine-tune that a little bit if we're going to use this kind of method to avoid objects. Um, but for now, we'll leave it on there. The last thing I want to take note of here is that this note up here that says the input system package is not installed. However, you see we have names in our input axis, and so that's going to use the legacy if you have it de uh, installed, which I do. And um, so we want to clear that out of there and make sure that 
we can take total control of our camera. And that leads us right into the last class that we have to write, which is going to be a little bit shorter, and that is the camera manager. Okay, let's start by grabbing a reference to our input reader and to our camera. Following that, let's set a range for how fast we want the camera to move around. A couple flags we're going to need is the right mouse button pressed, is the device a mouse, should we lock the camera, and we'll talk about that in a second. Now we've got three Unity actions to connect up to in our on enable method, and those were look, so we'll make a method to handle that. That was also enable mouse control camera and disable mouse control camera. So we'll put the, all those into separate methods. Let's start with enable mouse control camera. When that's pressed, let's set the flag for is right mouse button pressed be true. Then we are going to change the cursor on the screen. We'll hide it away. And then we're going to start a coroutine that'll just disable the mouse for one frame. And this is just going to prevent any sort of weird hiccups. This is just something that I like to put into all camera management systems. Likewise, we need a method for on disable mouse control camera. So we're just going to kind of do the opposite. Let's turn everything back on. However, at the end of this, we want to reset the camera axis. Let's just set the values right back to zero. Uh, you can imagine what will happen if you were dragging the mouse around, holding down the button, and suddenly it's on the far side of the screen. That's what you're trying to avoid, the snap into a weird position. So all we need to do to finish this up is our onLook method. Now let's change these variable names to be something meaningful. We're taking in the camera movement and the Boolean, whether or not this is a mouse. So if the camera is locked, return. If the device is a mouse and the player is not holding the right mouse button, return. Otherwise, let's get a device multiplier. Now, if the device is a mouse, we want to use time dot fix delta time. I'll just put a comment in here about that. Now, finally, we just want to set the values on our free look camera and we're all done. Well, I think we might be just about done writing code. I'm going to remove that one unnecessary variable there. I'm going to rearrange this so that on disable is up by on enable. Okay, let's add our new class onto our camera system. Now we need some references, of course. And I should have set a default speed. Let's do that. Let's just make it one. Okay, I'm just going to disable that Cinemachine Collider for now, just so it's not going to give me any problems while we're testing out everything else. I'm going to add one more public method to the input reader so that we can enable our player actions when the player is ready. So over here in the player, let's in the start method, let's call that when everything's set to go. Okay, let's give it a try and see how everything's come together. So, the camera's behaving the way I want. If I come backwards, the player turns towards the camera, can move side to side. That looks pretty good, actually. Seems like the only thing we're missing now is some animation. So let's go down into this RPG Tiny Hero animation set and find the idle one. What I generally like to do with these things is find the avatar and you can copy and paste this to make a copy of it. And let's just drag that over into our animation folder after we've renamed it. So I'll just call it player and drag it back over there. And then over in our animation folder, let's also make our own animator controller. I'm also going to call that player. Now, it's empty right now, but we have lots of animations we can use that came with the package. So this one here is the basic idle. Uh, I'm just going to call it locomotion because what we can do actually is just turn this into a blend tree. Just right click, create new blend tree state. 
and then double click to get into there. And then we can just add some animations here. My context menu is kind of off the screen, but you just add motions here. We want three of them. We'll get our idle and a walk and a run. For idle, let's just reach into the one we just had open there for the avatar and drag that one in. Now there's root motion and in place animations as well. Let's go into the in place and let's find this move forward. We'll reach into that one and we'll drag in that one into the second spot. And there's a sprint as well here. So let's drag sprint into the third spot. Now you can just use the automate thresholds if you want. If you want to tick this off and make them custom, go ahead. If you start pulling on this slider here, you can test it out in your preview window, but that's not really ideal. If you come down into the corner here where you see the little avatar, if you go down to the bottom, it's off my screen, I know, but the bottom option here is to select other and it'll bring up the little window. If you just pick none, it's going to reset what's in there. And one more pro tip, if you left click on this little bar right above the preview window, it'll pop out into this bigger window that you can then go and dock wherever you want. So you'll be able to play it like so, or you can go and play with your blend tree and adjust the speed there and actually see your model in something bigger than the corner window. Let's close this up. You can either close it the old fashioned way, or I've also added a class to our utilities that's in the repository. It'll let you close any tab or inspector with control W. We need to feed that speed value into the animator. So let's come back into the player controller. I'm going to use the string to hash method just because I don't like having text strings in my code other than right at the top if possible. So the animator has a method that'll turn that into an int and then we can just use that. It's also a little bit faster to calculate. So down in the update animator method, all we're doing is passing that value in. Back in the animator, let's change this default blend variable name to be speed. With that, let's give it a final little test here. Make sure that our player controller is working exactly the way we want. So the camera's coming in properly. You can move away, move towards. Yeah, that looks good. Side to side is good. It's kind of pretty snappy, so I might switch the rotation method there. I added one more script. If you go under File, there is now a Save Scene and Project that'll let you do that in one click or one keystroke. Okay, we got a lot done today. And we're going to get even more done next week when we start working on platforms, jumping abilities, and uh, maybe a few more surprises. So if you've watched this far and haven't subscribed to the channel yet and you're interested in following the rest of the series and building your own platformer, hit that subscribe button. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the comments below.